Yeah, we are ready to go. Great. So ready to pass four. And today it's my pleasure to to bring here Dr. Massimo Stella. He's recently joined us as a lecturer in computer science here in the University of Exeter, growing the big group with us. He holds a PhD in complex system simulation from the University of Southampton. He has more than 35 peer reviews publications in cognitive science, complex network, and network epidemiology. And he served as a council member in the Complex System Society. And he's also alumni from the, the famous Santa Fe Institute. So Massimo, welcome. And the floor is Thank yours. You. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here. And uh, uh, my talk will be a little bit of a collection of different recent research items that I published. And the title is Cognitive Networks as Knowledge Models for Accessing Key Ideas and Emotions in both online, online audiences and real world groups. And I would like to start with a simple question. What is knowledge? In data science, we might say the knowledge means achieving data about the world. Let's consider a simple example. We have a collection of documents, our starting data. We perform some linguistic analysis. We assume a certain baseline model. We come up with the prominence of these words plotted here as a word cloud in those documents. And that's it. But what does prominent mean here? What does the analysis mean here? What's the interpretation of our results? So this definition is a little bit limited in that uh, it neglects the fact that the documents that we were investigating actually come from a cognitive system that, is, that can be ourselves. And they definitely go through another cognitive systems, which is again, ourselves, our interpretations. In my research, I tried to bring the cognitive perspective to the dimension of knowledge analysis. So that to me, knowledge is data about the world that we assemble through our cognition. So that it's important to really consider the structure and the processing of information in our own minds in order to better interpret them. Only by merging data science, transparent modeling and cognitive theory, we can really understand knowledge and achieve next generation knowledge understanding tools and also investigate how knowledge influences human behavior. So I try to convey this complex systems approach with this visualization that merges that analysis, modeling, cognition, linguistics, and also complex networks. This complex systems approach requires for us to build new bridges across different disciplines. But this can be extremely, extremely useful in terms of finding new ways for, for exploring knowledge and also its structure by using a certain type of cognitive uh, grounding, which is the, the mental lexicon. When I really talk about the cognitive dimension, what I'm really talking is investigating this idealized system that is uh, responsible for the processing, elaboration, manipulation, storage, combination of data. Now, all these words, processing, storing, manipulation, and so on, they require uh, or they strongly relate with the, the way that computers process data. We all have our very own personal computers in our minds, uh, like the human brain and its cognitive counterpart. This mental lexicon is a cognitive counterpart to the circuits in the human brain. It's an idealized cognitive system that decades of research in psycholinguistics have shown to be important for acquiring storing, processing, and producing knowledge in the human mind in the form of language. Notice that when I talk about knowledge in the form of language, I'm not talking only about concepts or words, but I'm talking also about all the different uh, knowledge that surrounds them, like the instructions on how to pronounce words, or the grammatical relationships that there can be about words, or the visual cues that relate to words and their knowledge. So that this is a really, really fascinating and complex system. 
in my research together with my collaborators, we tried to use and investigate how associations between ideas in the mental lexicon were useful and powerful in order to predict and assess, assess a wide variety of phenomena, like for instance, early word learning in children, detecting the levels of creativity in people by using also machine learning, and also quantifying word processing in people with clinical impairments. In general, the structure of the mental lexicon influences a wide variety of phenomena. So it's really, really important to keep that into account when we want to investigate the structure of knowledge. The problem, however, is that unlike, like with the brain, we could actually bring a brain in the lab and tinker with it and play and see what types of regions of the brain are interconnected with each other in order to assess its structure. With an idealized system like the mental lexicon, we cannot do so. So this is a really fascinating system, especially for physicists. We are always accustomed to the idea that every system that has an influence over the real world can be brought in the lab and reproduced and played with. With these ideas, we cannot do so. We cannot directly access the mental lexicon in a lab setting. What we can do is accessing it indirectly either through cognitive tasks, and we will see a few of them in the second part of this talk, or through representations of the conceptual associations that are present in the knowledge of the mental lexicon in this cognitive structure. So that in this way, in order to access the mental lexicon indirectly, we need representations that in terms of cognitive networks. Cognitive network science is a rising field of investigation in research. Uh, a simple example, when we read language, we do not see the structure of conceptual associations between words. What we're doing right now is reading sentences, but these words in the sentences, they are interconnected through means, uh, by means of syntactic relationships. And these kinds of connections um, allow for us to combine the meanings of the individual words and then elaborate this information and come up with the meaning of the given of the final sentence. In order to really uh, attribute a meaning to the sentence, we need to access these syntactic relationships and then combine the meaning of words in order to fulfill our goal, this achievement. However, these associations are embedded in text and activated in our mental lexicon, even though we don't see them. Like in this case, machine learning is now capable of highlighting syntactic relationships uh, in uh, uh, very large corpora with a little bit of effort in terms of training. However, there are several linguistic models that enable the um, highlighting of these syntactic relationships. There are also other machineries that can even do the so-called part of speech tagging in order to identify how words are used in a certain context in a certain sentence. Accessing the structure of syntactic relationships is key in order to give structure to knowledge in text as it was meant by the author of the text. This is the main philosophical approach of my recent paper about uh, cognitive networks and text mining. I introduced the, what I call text mining formamentist networks which are networks combining conceptual associations in, term of, in terms of syntactic relationship and also semantic relationships, like in here in green, uh, where semantic relationships indicate the overlap in meaning between different words. The syntactic relationships instead, they determine which concept was related to another one without using stop words. So that, as you see, in the same sentence from before, we don't have um, connections or connectors in the network, but we rather have nouns and concepts. These concepts are also emotionally perceived. According to a large scale data set, uh, the emotion lexicon by Mohamed and Turney, uh, these, each word is classified as being positively perceived in uh, blue, negatively perceived in red or neutrally perceived according to a single large-scale population of people who rated the pleasantness or the uh, positivity rate 
what is called valence in psycholinguistics of a concept in isolation. A combination of emotional perceptions and conceptual associations can be highly informative, again, about the knowledge that is embedded by a certain author in a certain piece of text or in a certain collection of texts. And this opens up uh, a technical tool that I also benchmarked. It works quite nicely in terms of identifying key topics in short texts. And also it's quite useful for the investigation of larger uh, corpora texts. In this paper, I used formamentis networks in order to explore how social um, users perceived and discussed the, the topic of the gender gap in science. Very briefly, there is uh, extremely like overwhelming research um, about this gender gap. Uh, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see it so being so, so persistent in, the, in our educational system. Uh, at the end of high school, uh, male, males, male students and female students, so men and women are equally represented in the educational system. But as soon as the uh, undergraduate level at the university level, and then later on during the academic careers, uh, there is a huge gap between the representativeness of uh, females or women in science and men in science. Not only this, in terms of not only this gap in terms of representativeness, uh, there is also a gap in terms of the pay that uh, the stipends that uh, uh, women and men in STEM careers end up earning. So this is a really complex phenomenon. It is strongly, strongly related to uh, several aspects of the system. It's not just people um, uh, openly discriminating different genders. It's very much related to subconscious several smaller subconscious stereotypes and barriers that we need to explore, investigate, and possibly get rid of, solve in order in the future to close the gap. So my analysis uh, used this, I, a collection of 10,000 tweets about uh, with, with um, uh, hashtags related to the gender gap in science. And the idea was the following, each user when, pro when producing a certain tweet, is exploring their own mental lexicon, their own structured and emotional knowledge about different concepts, uh, about their experience. These users, they use this knowledge and encapsulate it in texts, in short messages, in tweets. My approach was to run um, a parser that extracted the network structure out of, out of all these tweets and then reconstructed a formamentis network that was representative of social, the whole, the overall social discourse about the gender gap and women in science. Now, notice that in this structure, it's particularly important to consider words not only in isolation, but how they are interconnected with each other, or better, how social discourse, how sentences and tweets in social discourse interconnected different concepts together with each other. This is important because uh, according to semantic frame theory in uh, psycholinguistics, the associations of a certain word with its associates in a certain piece of text or in a certain communication ends up casting meaning upon the original word itself. So that if we want to better understand the context in which a certain concept appear, uh, appeared and was discussed by online users, we need to check its associates, its immediate associates in terms of syntactic and semantic relationships. Not only this, in terms of a semantic frame. So we can reconstruct the semantic frame that users produced in their discussions through their language. Not only this, it's also that some words possess a certain emotional perception. And even though a certain word in isolation might be neutral, it's, uh, since it appears constantly in, uh, asso in association with other positive concepts, it can also acquire a positive connotation. This is called balance shifting. And it's an important, um, an important phenomenon in language, which makes it extremely difficult to assess the real meaning that different words had in different contexts. This can be quantified and measured through a network structure. And this is an example 
this is uh, what I'm plotting in A is the semantic frame of the concept of woman, how the concept of woman was discussed by online users. And the main impact, the, the main point here is that already the visualization is particularly uh, strong. It's telling us that uh, the social discourse around, specifically around women, was overwhelmingly positive. The clumps, the clusters that we see here are communities, network communities, as identified from a Louvain algorithm. We notice, however, that in the same community featuring women, there are some negative associates with concepts like woman oppressor, woman shot, woman kill, indebted, loan, and cry. These are semantic associations that all indicate the persistence of subconscious stereotypes and discriminations that are still present in a discourse that is overwhelmingly positive. So what would happen if we made some simple counts or some simple engrams? We would end up with a, a stance that is positive we would, however, lose microscopic information and detailed knowledge about the persistence of um, smaller and less frequent negative associations that we still need to act upon and better investigate. Uh, in here, I'm also producing on the right what I call an emotional flower. This flower is a collection of Z-scores um, according to eight dimensions, to according to a collection of different emotions, eight different emotional states whose combinations can give rise to a variety of more nuanced emotional states. Uh, the Z-scores were computed between by simply counting how many words in an empirical um, semantic frame were found eliciting for a certain emotion against random expectation, where random expectation keeps into account the fact that language is not uniform across emotions. There can be more words that elicit for a certain emotion and less words, fewer words that elicit for another emotion. So this randomization keeps that into account and provides a, a baseline for detecting how rich a certain uh, uh, semantic frame is in terms of which emotions. And we see here that it's mainly joy, trust, and anticipation that populate the semantic frame of woman in social discourse. There is also a little bit of surprise and uncertainty for the future. Notice that anticipation, and we will talk about this emotion later also, is a projection into the future. It's not really an emotion, it's rather an emotional state. By itself, anticipation can be both positive or negative. When combined with other emotions, this tells us that there is a little bit of uncertainty in the future, but this is a positive projection. And if we check the semantic content of the semantic frame, we can indeed see that much of the jargon is related to um, celebrating women in STEM and hoping for a resolution of the gender gap in the future. Talking about the gender gap, these are the semantic frames about the gender gap in social discourse. And again, we notice that there are positive emotions and a strong feeling of anticipation into the future related to the idea that the gender gap needs to be solved and addressed. If we notice again, the microscopic conceptual associations reported in this semantic frame, we notice that online users discuss the gender gap with associates like unconscious, bias, stereotype, unfounded. This again underlines the idea that the gender gap is really, really strongly interconnected with the subconscious stereotypes. In uh, cognitive psychology, there are also stereotype threats, which is a really odd, fascinating uh, psychological mechanism. Even though some groups are aware about stereotypes about themselves, their awareness is not enough for them to behave uh, normally. The knowledge about these uh, stereotypes impacts their performance. An example is women in science, girls in science, in STEM, being aware about the stereotype, women in, cell, in STEM are worse than men. This is a complete stereotype. It's completely unfounded. People are aware, girls especially, are aware about the stereotype, and yet their performance is worse because Cognition, unfortunately, is a complex system. So even these unconscious biases, they can act at that subconscious level and end up having important repercussions 
on real world performance and human behavior. So this is why it's important to keep track of them in many ways and in different, uh, in different topics and scenarios. Another investigation that, that they did by using formamentis networks was reconstructing the semantic frames of pandemic as produced by the WHO in their original definition and declaration of COVID-19 being a pandemic dated March 11th, 2020. And uh, also this declaration was reported by different news media and discussed on social media. So that I also compared the uh, semantic frames and emotional perceptions of pandemic across all these other sources. And this is the results. Uh, in the WHO declaration, the concept of pandemic was mostly associated with mixed content, mixing bo both neutral, positive and negative contents. The overall emotional portrayal was actually a portrayal of mild fear, which is relative to concern. The same news, COVID-19 is a pandemic, was reported and semantically framed in different ways by other news media. For instance, I'm reporting here another news media, News Media 4, which associated the pandemic with the much stronger negative concepts about uh, outbreak, alarm, stress, worry, very different perception. Also, other news media had another strategy. They resorted to um, associating pandemic with a neutral scientific jargon, explaining to the audiences what a pandemic is in terms of uh, increasing numbers, in terms of uh, an epidemiological curve. We need to change the curve. But this is what was reported by News Media 7, which elicited a higher level of trust in people in their readership. And then there was the social media. In here, 37,000 Italian tweets. And uh, as we can see, the semantic frame is way, way more uh, complex than uh, in other sources. This is expected, of course, because this is more people discussing and uh, uh, fra framing the concept of a pandemic. The interesting thing is that uh, this knowledge is highly structured. There are clusters of concepts, positive ones related to hopefulness in the future, in order we need to help each other in order to face a pandemic, but there are also negative clusters related to desperation and uh, fear. So again, in the investigation of social media, it's difficult to make conclusions based on simple positive or negative outcomes or based on simple aggregations of knowledge information around only individual concepts. What we need to do in the future is to embrace the richness of knowledge structure that gravitates around concepts. And this can be highly, highly informative about the way that social users perceive and discuss their events. Uh, I did also similar analysis uh, with um, in another paper that was recently published on first Monday about the social discourse after the first lockdown in Italy. I investigated 400,000 Italian tweets about the so-called Fase 2. And uh, uh, the results were several, were quite interesting. The main one was that emotions on social media can flicker very quickly. And social media are extremely uh, sensitive to news media. This is again quite, uh, this is only like starting to be understood right now. There are several patterns of information seeking that lead to the proliferation of certain news media also based on their content or their emotional stance. Uh, this, the proliferation of this content can be massive and this can greatly influence the way that people talk about or the way that individual users talk about topics. For instance, in here, I'm plotting the semantic frame of quarantine before lockdown release on May 4th, 2020, and after lockdown release. Please notice that both these frames are based on, the, on an equal number of uh, 25,000 uh, tweets featuring that concept of quarantine. And as we can see, the, before, the, before the lockdown release, emotions like trust, and anticipation were quite strong in social discourse. People were waiting for the lockdown to be, sorry, to be released. After the lockdown release in Italy, we registered several cases of contagious, of contagions. 
and uh, mm, several deaths. And this actually influenced the way that you, social users talked about the quarantine. They wanted to go back to, to quarantine in order to feel safer. Positive emotions in the semantic frame vanished and we found uh, uh, sadness, a strong feeling of sadness. So it's important not only to be detailed enough to understand the knowledge structure in social media around specific concepts. It's also important to investigate it over time because some emotions might change quite quickly uh, in the system, in the social system. Another investigation that did with the semantic frames with these textual formamentis networks was to investigate the concept of politics. Politics is a really important concept because uh, it's related to the institutions and it's related to legislations, especially during a pandemic, during lockdown. Uh, during a pandemic in general, politicians are the ones that are supposed to take measures for their citizens. I uh, found that before the lockdown, social discourse was mostly trustful around politics, even though there was also a hint of sadness. After lockdown release, we had several problems with legislation because it was quite confused and uh, business owners did not know how to reopen, how it was safe for them to reopen. This created some contrast that was reflected in social discourse by um, a persistence of trust, uh, but by an increase in, a negative, in negative emotions like anger. In the Atlas of Emotions, and in general in organizational psychology, we know that the coexistence of trust with other negative emotions is a symptom of social tension. It's quite complex in order to detect which types of trust are present in the system, but this can be done with language analysis, with linguistic analysis. Social tension is particularly, um, it's a delicate issue because especially during a lockdown, if people don't feel strongly enough about following the guidelines of an institution, they can rather change their risk behavior, their risk averse behavior. And this can be problematic. This can cause uh, protests, uh, social denouns, and it can ultimately impact the contagion itself. Social media can be used for monitoring the presence of these tensions with relatively little effort even though it's extremely, extremely important to take into account that what one can monitor is really social media, so online users. Whether these social media is representative of the overall country, this is a really delicate topic, especially because social media are complex systems and they are not only monitored by human, they are not only populated by human users, but also by social bots. In our PNAS paper in 2018, what we did was monitoring social discourse about the Catalan referendum, uh, which was at the end of 2017. And uh, in A, I'm plotting in A, in the picture up above on the left, I'm plotting social interactions between human users and uh, social bots in human users are in blue and social bots are in red. Very briefly, social bots are not human users. They are AI or like pieces of software that are coded in order to obtain a behavior that resembles the human behavior so that they can share content. They can also produce their own content. They can like tweets, they can reshare tweets. They can indeed participate in social discourse. And what we found in this investigation by mixing together the social interactions with the cognitive content of these messages was that social bots um, interacted mainly with two groups in the network of social interactions. But they did it differently according to the emotional content of these messages. So that in one group, social bots produced, produced mostly uh, content with negative sentiment. And we used VADER in order to detect the sentiment in English, Catalan, and Spanish tweets. In the other group, instead, social bots produced mainly positive content with positive sentiment. In the layout of social interactions, 
this content, this knowledge, uh, flowed mostly from social bots to influential human users. So that social bots were targeting with specific emotional content, specific online users around the Catalan referendum. By using a cognitive approach, by building again a sort of mental lexicon for the language of these bots, we identified that group one contained content and some, in this case, hashtag co-occurrences, hashtags strongly related with independence and violence um, and violent uh, behavior. Social bots contributed to this. They improved, increased, inflamed this social group by producing content that was absent in tweets produced by human users. This is one example, but there is like a huge and increasing literature about the role that social bots can have. The idea is that uh, uh, social bots were even found to be, to exert an influence in uh, real world events like massive votings. They were found to be able to manipulate electoral beliefs of human users. Social bots can participate in social discourse and alter the semantic frames that people are exposed to. And since people are exposed to a quite a large amount of information on social media, they are overwhelmed. They are also more sensitive to this content, to this potentially fake content or distorted mindset produced by social bots. So that it's extremely important in the analysis of social media to keep into account uh, who is discussing what and how also, what are the emotions that are flowing along these social interactions. And this is extremely important uh, also because we really want to understand better and better how these cognitions shape up online and how these ideas end up influencing human behavior in the real world. We can do this in a different way by merging complex networks and representations of the mental lexicon that can help us in the cognitive interpretation of the results that we obtain, and by also using machine learning and data science as strong allies. So this is the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk, I would like to talk not about online users, but in terms of people. I would like to talk about education and uh, uh, how we can get inside the students' heads. Massimo, Let me introduce you. Oh, yeah. We, we have a few questions related to this part. Oh. Do you prefer to get all in the end or, or right now? Uh, maybe I can go quickly through this part and we can then go get all the questions all together. So maybe that would be useful. This, this is a very brief part. Okay. I okay. don't know how different this part from the other. So. Okay, it's so a little bit different, but it, it's it's a little bit better to finish this up. Otherwise, I I might just reply to the answers on the first question and probably not have time to finish this. Okay. So if okay. you just bear with me ten minutes, I will then go through all the questions that you have. Okay. Okay. So you you go ahead. Okay. Okay, and uh, let me introduce you to Mike. Mike is a high school student. He's smiling. He's in a library. And Mike says that he never understood science and he's proud of it. This is a concerning negative attitude of closure towards STEM. And this is important uh, for how many students end up choosing a career in STEM at university level. How can we better investigate this negative attitude that uh, is increasingly uh, more and more reported uh, in uh, the relevant literature? The idea is trying to use the right key for accessing and uh, getting inside the student's head. And uh, as we said in the first part, we can use um, complex networks. And the idea that knowledge in the human mind is structured in terms of conceptual associations and also emotions. In this case, these formamentis networks that we introduced with my colleagues in 2019, Sara De Nigris, Alexander Alovich, and Cynthia Siu, these formamentis networks, they are based not on syntactic relationships on text. They are based on a cognitive task by the individual users that we interviewed. They still possess a network structure. So the connections between concepts indicate conceptual associations and the emotional perceptions indicate how positively, negatively or neutrally concepts were perceived. 
But this is now based on a cognitive task, not on machine learning. This task is, is called free associations. Free associations are memory recall patterns. They um, model semantic memory in the mental lexicon, which is really the um, subcomponent of the mental lexicon that lets us associate concepts without a clear specific association, but by simply memory uh, patterns. So I recall that I did this. It works very simply. Uh, what is the first word that comes to your mind when reading complex? So imagine that you read complex and need to think about, and need to say the first word that comes to your mind. When I read complex, I think of system, mystery, emergent. Now this task is called continuous free association game. Complex is a, a cue that at least it stimulates the recollection of other words. These other words are called targets. We can draw links between cues and targets and come up, if we do this for more cues, with a complex network structure of free associations. Free associations have been extremely powerful in, the, in cognitive uh, network science in order to identify memory patterns, predict early world learning, again, assess the creativity of individuals, and even reconstructing writing styles and quantifying cognitive decline in people with aphasia. What we did was performing the free association game with uh, uh, two populations, within two populations, 159 high school students in Italy and 59 early stage researchers in STEM. So mostly PhD students and postdocs and early stage uh, researchers. What we found in this data set was that uh, negative words surrounded by negative associates elicited a stronger level of anxiety compared to negative words surrounded by a mix of positive, negative, or neutral words. Stronger level of anxiety is going to be a key part, a key um, finding for the uh, few more slides to come. In fact, what I would like to do now is try to identify the usual suspects in STEM and see how students and STEM professionals framed semantically and emotionally individual aspects of science. Let's try to do this for mathematics. In professionals, mathematics was a positively perceived concept surrounded mostly by neutral and positive uh, concepts. Uh, connections that are thicker, they are stronger. They were made by more individuals. Notice that now in these formamentis networks, the same concept can be ranked or um, emotionally perceived in different ways in different groups, because this is really individual people that in the cognitive task, uh, they click, they make a certain evaluation. So that in students, this evaluation of mathematics might be different, not only in terms of associates, but also in terms of emotional perceptions. How do you think that students perceive, high school students at the end of the final year in a curriculum uh, focused towards STEM subjects perceive mathematics? Well, I'm sorry, I, I can't see your replies yet, but this is the results. Students perceive maths as a negative concept surrounded mostly by negatively perceived concepts. So possessing a negative emotional aura. For physics, STEM uh, researchers, professionals, they perceived as a, they perceived physics as a, com as a positive concept surrounded mostly by other positive concepts and neutral concepts. In students, this was different. They perceived physics as a negative concept, uh, surrounded mostly by other negative concepts, except for a cluster of positive jargon related to experiments in the lab. So concrete ways for exploring physics. What about science? Professionals perceive science as a positive concept, overwhelmingly surrounded by positive associates, what about students? Do their negative perceptions diffuse and influence also their semantic frame of science? The answer is no. 
Actually, students perceive science as an abstract concept, positive, with, with a positive emotional perception, with a positive aura, with many other positive associates, except for mathematics and physics. Why? The powerfulness of formamentis networks, like we saw also in the first part, is to be able to reproduce the structure of knowledge and emotions of that people reconstruct in their own minds. This gives us detailed access in the way that people see concepts, in the way that people imagine concepts or structure their ideas around them. For professionals, mathematics is really a creative process strongly related to physics and science and to the investigation of the nature, natural environment around us. For students instead, the semantic content of the associates, remember we said semantic frame theory can help us reconstructing the meaning attributed to words by checking their associates. Well, these associates are mostly related to dry jargon about ways of doing calculation. That's it. There are no real positive uh, uh, aspirations about mathematics being useful for something, for exploring their surrounding world and for understanding it better. And uh, this dry perception of mathematic, mathematics is strongly surrounded by a negative aura, which we said in the, earlier, this is a sign for anxiety and anxious perception of mathematics. And this is in agreement with recent results about maths anxiety, so that these networks might be used in order to test for the present of math anxiety in student populations. The same is also val valid for physics. In STEM professionals, physics is a concept that is strongly related, related and associated with the concepts like adventure. It features associations like art and data, science and fun. All these associations, they identify or indicate a creative mindset around physics, which is unfortunately absent in students. So that we should probably think about different ways in teaching in order to improve and enhance the creative aspects and the creative portrayals of these STEM subjects that are fundamental for scientific careers. In another work, in another collaboration, we also um, investigated this, this further and related this different uh, negative and positive perceptions to the absent in students of a computational thinking mindset in a data literacy that they have about using data and calculations in order to better understand their word. This was, for instance, represented in their semantic frame of model, which is very loosely related to science, but as in researchers instead, model is much more strongly and tightly interconnected with concepts like research, science, investigation, simulations, and computers. So in order to really improve this uh, fragmented and dissonant perception of some subjects, we could use formamentis networks in order to get some maps or indications that are driven indications on which types of conceptual associations we should enhance and encourage in our student populations. And I really hope to be able to do this also at the university level in order to see whether there are changes in the mindset of students before and after the course and what's also their emotional uh, perception and stance of the tools that they end up acquiring. This is important because to, we really want to improve and disseminate, especially in computer science and in data science, positive perceptions like the ones that we identified in researchers. Okay, and that was it. Thank you so much for your attention. I will now go through all the questions just the very last shameful advertisement. Uh, there will be a satellite at the next conference on complex systems about complexity and cognition. There will be several invited talks. You can still register. If you're interested in these kinds of approaches, please register and attend it. And thank you so much for your uh, time. And now questions. Thank you, thank you, Massimo. It was very, very interesting, very, very, delightful to see the power that we can make with the, those associations. So the first question is from Ronaldo, and he asking how much history do you need to have from a person to be able to model these emotions? 
Yeah, uh, this is a very nice question. I think the data that uh, the data that I analyzed in here is data about uh, general groups, general audiences in the overall section. Um, I can say that uh, the data that you need, it could be quite small in the end. We don't need it too much. Uh, we don't need too much about it because these associations, they can change over time, uh, depending on the mood and so on. But the stronger ones are quite persistent. So it would be easy even to do the same task twice in order to come up with a sort of backbone that can characterize uh, students, for instance, or students' perceptions. I did this in another paper that I didn't present it here for a consulting in Norway. Um, we had uh, two interviews in a population of eight students before and after a training about um, uh, robotics and innovation. And with only two interviews, with uh, an, in an interview lasted for 40 minutes, they did this cognitive task, like um, um, producing associates and so on. And already that task was informative about um, uh, anxiety and uh, um, particular stances about coding, uh, mathematics uh, in, uh, across all these students. This was confirmed with the personal interviews. Uh, so this is for like the cognitive part. For the online social part, I would say that given that there is this cognitive counterpart, also in the online component, uh, even with very short texts, uh, we should be able to profile users. And this is a good thing, but also a scary thing. For instance, I've uh, recently reviewed a paper that uh, used only 50, tw 50 tweets, so five zero, in order to detect uh, successfully with a high accuracy, uh, trolling behavior in online users uh, in uh, on Twitter. 50 tweets is really a small amount of content. Of course, there can be individuals that don't produce this content through social media. This is back to the idea that we need to be very careful about representativeness of these data. But the amount of information is not too much. We can do quite a few things with even small or limited amount of info on data. So kind of a kind of <clears throat> a follow up question on this is like how can we validate that these these emotions are or truly represent the personality like the duality bit between what you are online and what you are offline so whatever you get on, online it really represents what you are, what what you are in person and even if using the example that you said before in the interview can can people just understand what are the expected outcomes and then give the, the correct answer. So how, how to truly measure the personality? Yeah, the, I think this is a, a really good question and a really complex one. Uh, there are several different models that try to mm, measure personality based on ratings and scales, the big five and so on. But the idea that there is a counterpart between online behavior and real world behavior is definitely delicate. So the validation definitely needs more research uh, in order to understand how people really feel, how really behave. And I think we're only starting to acknowledge this and starting to do research about this right now. Um, I think historically, we're a little bit far behind, further behind, like I we see many investigations using sentiment on social media, but they don't do much um, knowledge analysis or semantic analysis or emotional profiling. So this is already an improvement. The next improvement will definitely be trying to correlate these emotions that are in the real world and see how do they behave or how they are represented in the, uh, in the online environment. Like, this connection between online and real definitely requires more research. In terms of interviews, I didn't show the results to the students, so they were unaware about their outcomes. Um, and uh, uh, there is also an important component in here that free associations are timed, so there is a time constraint. I need to think very quickly about this. And this is ex exceptional in uh, inhibiting people from lying. So this technique, uh, free associations, has been used in psychology also for detecting uh, uh, traumas or traumatic experiences, because it really investigates the mm, semantic memory that we have. 
we should definitely, this is a good idea for a research grant in the future, try to validate this with the numbers. So try to really put uh, an accuracy, uh, ask for people to perform the formamentis task and then see if this correlates with their self-assessment. But, uh, but I always see that self-assessment is important in this kind of, of investigations. And assuming, assuming that there is a, a fourth correlation, with, uh, strong correlation between uh, online persona and real persona, could we in the future use this technique like to, to match? Imagine that we have bots, but not bots that are simply retweeting, but bots that are creating uh, some sort of content, but they are creating by someone real that are typing, or they have a collection of text that they want to spread, but they are just using bots as a, a way to, to, to propagate those ideas. Can we try to use this type of network of knowledge to try to match who these bots are very like to this other persona here and try to match who are the, the owner? Absolutely, I think this would be extremely useful to do. And uh, I think this is my research uh, directions for the future. This would be extremely useful because it, it could be another feature that we can use in order to detect bots. Right now, the detection of social bots is still an open field where there are huge, in the last few years especially, they have made huge improvements by certain groups like the, the group in Indiana and other groups around the world. But it's still quite difficult to detect uh, um, content that is malicious, content that comes from social bots, even content that is coming from real people, but it is fake, so misinformation. There have been a few papers, um, I remember Cinelli, 2020, uh, telling us that the social dynamics of these fake and real content is actually very much the same, doesn't change too much. There was another paper that was very recently published that said, maybe if we do multiplex networks, we can try to check some differences, find some differences on Twitter. Uh, but it's still extremely difficult to um, characterize fake content based only on their social interactions. We definitely need to go further and check the semantic content of these investigations. And I see these kinds of networks giving structure to the language that we have as being quite promising for this sort of task, for relating, um, like for finding impostors or for finding fake uh, personas online. Well, there are ma many areas to explore. So soon uh, later, I will, I'll post a link on the chat. So if you are interested in Persona PhD, we have some PhD opportunities funding for the next, next year entry. So keep on. And another question is from Mariana. So she's asking, what's the performance of this framework for different language? Do you do different language reveal similar relationships? I have not tested yet on other languages. Um, the the Formamentis Network said it is only for English tweets, um, but I uh, this machinery can be translated in other languages because the emotional lexicon dataset is available for other languages. Although it's an automatic, um, it's an automatic uh, um, change. Um, I must say that in my exploratory study, I used it, that in Italian. I did that in Italian. Um, but in terms of, uh, of performance, I, I cannot say much, I guess, because this is really not a, a simple task to say whether a stance is positive or negative. This is much more complex in terms of reconstructing the semantic content. So the, the, pro, the real limitation is that uh, we don't want automatic translations right now. We do want um, native data from, for different languages. And native data is something that I have not um, tried to play with yet, but it would be useful to try and build this up. So try to build these kinds of emotional data for native English, native Italian speaker, native Spanish speakers and so on. Uh, it would be also interesting to train the language model that does the syntactic associations directly in other languages in order to really increase and improve their performances. I have a question regarding the second part. So you show like the difference between the, the knowledge representation. I'm not sure if this is the term but like between students and, and, and professionals. So can, do you, you know if there is any longitudinal study that shows that 
the difference here when you see like the positive relation to math to a negative relation to math is the person who is changing or like when you're a student you hate math or, or no it's stable in the person and the person who relates good with math in the early stage they are more likely to go and follow that path um, I've not seen uh, like longitudinal studies using these kinds of networks because this, these are again very recent. But from the from my consulting in Norway, we did a longitudinal study. So we had a small population that we didn't do any statistical testing. But we noticed that in students trained in engineering, the semantic frames that they had for mathematics, computing, and so on, uh, STEM terminology expressed the um, awareness about their knowledge. Uh, we also had nursing uh, students and they instead expressed, uh, uh, of course, a lack of awareness and also negative attitudes towards mathematics and physics. So it might be interesting in the future to scale this up and uh, perform uh, longitudinal analysis and seeing even in students, for instance, if there are students that have positive perceptions or there are good students that have very bad negative perceptions. So they are good at performing like problem solving, but they hate that. So what we can do right now with the, the way that we assess students in general is rank them according to the problem solving capacity. But we cannot say really anything about their emotional attitude. And this is, I guess, a huge component that plays a big role in terms of, of students then deciding their careers for the future. So this will be a gap that we should definitely fill in the future. Interesting, interesting. I just, I just talked about, like, there, is there some classifications of, of, from words? Like, there are some words that are much more stable in relation to their, their definition. Something is good, is good forever or some other words that they are much more contextualized, like the one that you show, like quarantine. Quarantine, the words were related to quarantine was not related to quarantine per se, but the context is was before the quarantine, after the quarantine. But is there some 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 types of word or some group of word that I don't know, these words are, are powerful. They are always represented as the root meaning of them. I think uh, there are several answers to this question. In um, psychology, for instance, uh, a, a technique for investigating uh, language is called linguistic inquiry. The linguistic inquiry is a set of inventories of lists of words whose presence is discriminative of specific aspects of language. So for instance, there is a list of words related to dominance. So that if, if in a certain text, uh, we notice an abundance of these words, what we can say right now, and this is a commonly used technique, is that, uh, yeah, there is a, a dominant aspect of language in that part. I've seen different approaches to this. I've seen also machine learning and also deep learning now applied to these kinds of investigations. However, there are concepts that are quite representative of some areas of, um, of, of language, of some aspects of language. However, they are not universal. And also what's extremely, I didn't mention this, but in, in all my techniques, I use syntactic dependencies also for negating meaning. So that if a word is connected to not or no in the original text, when I compute the emotional profiling, I negate the meaning of these words by checking for their negations, for their antonyms. And this is possible thanks to machine learning. If we do just accounting, like in this linguistic inquiry, we might end up with very biased information so that the word is present, but its meaning, because there is a syntactic relationship, is actually the opposite. So we should be very careful. And then there is also another very interesting aspect of language that is kernels. Kernels are very small regions of language, very basic information that is useful in order to fully understand a wide variety of situations. Um, this kind of kernel is composed of general words, general concepts uh, that might have a universal perception. But unfortunately, these kernels, we don't know whether they are stable or not across cultures. For instance, in free associations, we notice that the same concept can have different semantic frames 
according to the native language of the people that you ask to complete the task, the association task. Like recently, there is the Small Word of Words project that is trying to build native data sets of free associations across languages and is finding, for instance, that uh, um, different words possess different associates uh, uh, across it, between Italians and British people or between British people and Americans. Um, so it's, this is quite, um, uh, quite, a delicate, uh, quite a delicate topic. So there is some universality but there is also variability across languages. So, languages. so it's really important to keep these aspects into account and yeah, a, avoid doing automatic uh, translations again. This is something yeah. we should avoid. It's a very fascinating subject. We could spend the whole night talking about this, but our time is over. So thank you again, Massimo, yeah. for, for this nice talk. And thank you all for keeping watching and for those who watch later, not live. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.